and you can find a seat if you will, because I'm getting ready to preach to you. Is that cool? Getting ready to preach to you tonight. Hey, uh, if you have a Bible, I want you to go over to an Old Testament prophet by the name of Ezekiel. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to go to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, specifically chapter 43. We will read two verses of scripture, verses 12 and 13. At first glance, these pass- this passage is not going to make much sense to you. But by the end of the evening, I believe it is going to carry a massive amount of weight in your life. Can I, let me give you a bit of a caveat before I go into this. I'm going to teach for a little while, and then I'm going to preach. All right? All that is is like for a while, I'm going to be explaining some things, and then I'm going to get loud. I may grab the mic like that. You know what I mean? That, like that's the difference. This is teaching. This is preaching. Okay? The transition will happen. I promise you. So bear with me. Ezekiel chapter 43. Verses 12 through 13, this is how the Lord wants to end this conference. God writes this. You have to understand, though Ezekiel is the mouthpiece, God is the author. God is the one speaking. Now, that is true of every nook and cranny of Scripture, but it's extra true right now because Ezekiel is a literal prophet. And this is the word of the Lord that came to the prophet Ezekiel, not through him, to him. This is literally the audible voice of God coming to Ezekiel. He says this, this is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountaintop is most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. Now notice God repeats himself here. He says, this is the law. Then he says, this is the law again. Listen to me. Anytime you find God repeating himself, you need to slow down. God is not a man who wastes his words. If he is being redundant, the redundancy is on purpose. The reason for the redundancy is to try to get you to slow down. It's the same reason there are speed bumps leading up to a yellow light, trying to get your attention. Hey, slow down. I've got something for you here. Don't blaze through this. I know you're trying to read, you know, three chapters on the weekdays and five chapters on the weekend in order to get through the Bible in a year, but I actually want you to park it right here for a second. The redundancy is to get you to slow down because God has something powerful to say. Behold, this is the law of the temple. Then he says this, these are the measurements of the altar in cubits. Notice the parentheses. The cubit is one cubit and a hand breadth. The cubit is one cubit and a hand breadth. I want to stop there for just a few moments. Tonight, I want to preach a message. I'm simply calling this Give me a hand. Give me a hand. Here in this moment, as I've already kind of laid out for you, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet Ezekiel. Now, the reason God is having to speak to Ezekiel about this subject matter, and the subject matter, let me just break it down for you real clearly. God is talking to Ezekiel about the restoration of the temple of God. That's what God is talking about in this moment. He's telling Ezekiel, hey, I want to restore the holy place. I want to restore my house. Now, the reason that God is having to speak to Ezekiel about the restoration of the temple is because the temple was destroyed. It was destroyed. In 586 BC, Babylon pillaged Jerusalem, and upon pillaging, ransacking Jerusalem, they ransacked, desecrated, and demolished the temple of God. This is a historical fact. Babylon, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, came through and pillaged Jerusalem and desecrated and demolished the temple of God. And so after the enemy of the people of God demolished the temple of God, God finds a man of God and begins to speak to him and say this, I want to restore what the enemy destroyed. That's what he's saying. I want to restore what the enemy destroyed. And if I had time tonight, listen to me, I would help you see how Babylon, this wicked and perverse nation, this wicked and perverse kingdom, is almost a mirror image of the world we live in today. Babylon is but a type and a shadow. It's a mirror portrait 
of the culture of our world today. What this is saying is the world has crept into the church and it's choking it. That, that's what God has to say. And it seems like the world has won. It seems like Babylon has had the upper hand. It seems like Babylon has the final say. And then God says, actually, the story isn't over until I say it's over, and I've decided to speak. I want to restore the temple of God. And can I just prophesy for a second? I feel this like a fire in my bones. I believe that God in this day is looking for some Ezekiels who he can entrust some blueprints to as to how to restore the holy things, as to how to bring the glory back to where we don't just have good CCM songs that make it onto the radio, but we see the kingdom of darkness emptied and the kingdom of light advancing at an astronomical rate. I believe God is looking for Ezekiel in this day and age. God is looking for some young people he can entrust with blueprints on how to restore what seems lost? I'm not here for good church. I love church. I'm about as churchy as they come. Don't let the tattoos fool you. I had to get tattoos so I looked like I had a testimony. That's a true story. My wife's like, yo, he's a square. Like, she's like, he's, yeah, I'm an old soul. But I believe, listen to me, God isn't interested in good church. God isn't interested in just having a little goose bump, and I'm all for the goose bump, but God is interested in us encountering the holy things. God is interested in encountering a people. God is interested in touching a people so severely. He touches them so severely, they literally never walk the same way ever again. I believe God's looking to touch someone like he did Jacob, to where you literally walk with a limp the rest of your life. And when people ask why you limp, it's, I, I, God touched me. You literally have to blame God for the way that you walk. God wants to encounter someone so severely, only he can get the glory. And I believe that's what's going to happen tonight. God is looking for some Ezekiels he can speak words of restoration to. But notice this. He says, I'm going to restore the temple. And he begins to give Ezekiel the blueprints. And he gives him the blueprints. Hang with me. I know this is going to weird you out. You'll be like, what's the significance? I'll, I'll make it clear. He gives Ezekiel the blueprints in cubits. That's what he does. He says, you're going to measure the altar. You're going to build this thing. You're going to restore this thing using a common Bible measurement called a cubit. Now, if you are a Bible lover, like if you are a Bible person, if you love the scriptures, which I pray you do, I pray you do, you are familiar with this term cubit, okay? If you read your Bible like, like you should, you will trip over it from time to time quite often, okay? It is a common Bible measurement. The first place in scripture this idea of the measurement known as the cubit pops up is when God comes to a man by the name of Noah, God comes to Noah and he begins to give him instructions on building an ark. And he gives Noah the dimensions of the ark in cubits. That's the first mention of it, okay? It's mentioned many places after that. But one of my favorites is 1 Samuel 17. Anybody know 1 Samuel 17, David and Goliath, okay? In, David, in the story of David and Goliath, we have Goliath's height mentioned in cubits. Your Bible says that Goliath is six cubits and a span tall. It was a common measurement. They used it over and over and over. It was how they measured things. Not only how they built things, but how they would even evidently, according to 1 Samuel 17, how they would even measure their enemy. It was a very common measurement. And let me break it down. The reason they used the cubit is it's because that's all they had. It's like all they had. They didn't live in our day. They didn't live in our age. Like, I hate to break it to you, but they didn't have a tape measure. Like, they had never heard of a ruler, okay? They had never heard of a yardstick. Now, in 2024, I have an app on my phone that will tell me the height of something in both feet and inches. We are sophisticated, folks. We have come a long way. They didn't have all that, so they had to use what they had. And what everybody had 
was a cubit. Now, in order for you to wrap your mind around a cubit, because listen to me, if you don't understand what a cubit is, you will never understand the significance of what God is saying here. Here's what a cubit is. A cubit is six hand breaths. That's what a cubit is. A cubit is six hand breaths. You're like, what's a hand breath? Let me help you. I'm gonna need some crowd participation in this moment. Everybody, no, you, you can stay in your seat. I, I love the eagerness. They're like, pick me. <laughs> But I do need you to actually put your hand out there. So everybody, put your hand forward. We're going to find out what a hand breath is. Take your thumb and fold it over. Put your fingers together. The distance between your forefinger and the end of your pinky is one hand breath. That's one hand breath. Now, leave, leave your hand breath up. I'm not done with your hand breath. Leave it up. Leave it up. Leave it up. Ironically... I told you a cubit is six hand breaths. Ironically, if you measure from the crease in your elbow to the end of your middle finger, let's measure it right now, just so you know I'm not lying. The average person, if they measure from the crease in their elbow to the end of their middle finger, let's measure six real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six. This portion of your arm is six hand breaths, unless you have a little bit of a different arm, okay? Some of you are chuckling. I think there may be some of those among us tonight. The Lord is with you still. The Lord is with you still, okay? But the average person, the average person's distance from the crease in their elbow to the end of their middle finger is six hand breaths. Listen to me, don't miss it, don't miss this, don't miss this. This right here is a cubit. That's a cubit right there. And in Bible days, they would use this portion of their arm to measure things out. So if you were to like walk up on Noah, trying to cut some of the gopher wood that God told him, he'd have been like, one, two, three. I mean, like, you're like, Noah, what's wrong with you, my man? He's like, I'm using my cubit. Back off my cubit. It's a commonplace measurement. Here's a really interesting thought. Here's a really, this is, this is me nerding out right now, okay? Hebrew rabbis teach that this portion of the arm that we, we have just found out is a cubit. They teach that this portion of the arm is called the mother of the arm. The mother of the arm. And the reason they call it that is because whatever the mind can imagine, this portion of the arm gives birth to it. Whatever your mind can imagine, if you can get a solid enough blueprint in your mind, this portion of the arm goes to work. This portion of the arm gets involved. And now all of a sudden, what was once just some gases floating through neural pathways in your brain is now a real object. What was once imaginary is now actually real. And you can trade it. You can sell it. You can use it. The mother of the arm can get some stuff done. I'm here to tell you right now, the mother of the arm is extremely talented. And they found out very quickly how talented their cubit was. You can imagine all the things they would use the cubit to build. Nehemiah in the Bible restored a wall, no doubt measured in cubits. They would build weapons of war using this measurement of a cubit. They would build instruments. You find David in the Old Testament playing the harp and the lyre using a cubit. They would build palaces. They would build, uh, um, honestly, wonders of the world simply using the cubit. They found out real quick that six hand breaths can get a lot done. I mean, look at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Everybody puts their cubit together and notice who has to get involved to stop them, God. Literally, everybody bands together. They're like, we're gonna build a tower all the way to heaven and the only person that can stop them is God because the cubit of a man's hand, the six hand breaths that make up your cubit is incredibly gifted. I'll prove it to you. It was 1,500 years from the day of Jesus all the way to the day of Leonardo da Vinci. That is a 1,500 year span. From the day of Jesus to the day of Leonardo da Vinci, it is 1,500 years. And inside of that 1,500 years, knowledge doubled. Knowledge doubled in just 1,500 years. So from the day of Jesus to the day of Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci's day knew twice as much as Jesus' day. 
Then all of a sudden, knowledge doubled in 250 years. Then after that, the next time it doubled, it doubled in just 50 years. Then after that, it began to double in just 10 years. This is in the 1960s. In the 1960s, knowledge was doubling at a rate of every 10 years. In the 1980s, Knowledge was doubling at a rate of every two years with the invention of the computer. It was the early days of the computer, and computer technology was changing the game. It, it, and information was coming in faster than they could hold it. In the year 2000, knowledge was doubling every six months. In 2010, knowledge began to double every three months. The latest statistic done in 2020 tells us that right now, knowledge is doubling at a rate of every 12 hours. Right now, knowledge is doubling at a rate of every 12 hours. This means 12 hours from now, mankind as a whole will know twice as much as we do right now. Think about how quickly things are moving. Think about how quickly advances are being made. This is pervasive. This is honestly on an exponential growth curve. This is nonstop. It's almost too much to even be able to wrap your mind around. Think about AI and all the, the, the artificial intelligence that is now used in order to harvest data and understand things and write books and create curriculum and teach people how to do work and honestly even replace people doing work. Technology is advancing at an astronomical rate because the hand of man is incredibly gifted. The hand of man is incredibly gifted. I don't know if you travel much outside of the Rio Grande Valley, but I have the privilege of getting to travel a little bit. And one of the places I have traveled to was Dubai. I've been to Dubai. You know the, the old video, Dubai was lit. Y'all ever, you're too young for that. Okay, never mind. All the millennials got it. All the millennials got it. Gen Z's like, what are you talking about? That's tough, twin. That's tough, twin. That's a new one I learned. I've been to Dubai, is what I'm trying to say. And in Dubai, listen to me, in Dubai, they have a building called the Burj Khalifa. The Burj Khalifa is the tallest building on earth. It stretches half a mile into the sky. I remember standing in Dubai at the foot of the Burj Khalifa and thinking, man made that. Like human beings made the Burj Khalifa. Not only was I impressed by the Burj Khalifa, do you know how long it took me to get to Dubai? 14 hours. From Dallas to Dubai in 14 hours. Do you know how long it took the pilgrims to cross the Atlantic on the Mayflower? 66 days. It took the pilgrims 66 days to get across the Atlantic. It took me 14 hours, not to cross the Atlantic, to cross the globe. Get on the other side of the world. What I'm trying to tell you is man is incredibly gifted. Where man finds a problem, man will find an answer using the six hand breadths of his cubit. The cubit of a man's hand, the mother of the arm, is incredibly gifted. And you know why? It's because man is made in the image of God. That's why. It's because man is made in the image of a creative and very gifted God. But here's the problem. It's not too long after all of a sudden you find out you've got some gifts. You find out you got a little talent. You find out that the six hand breaths that make up the cubit of your arm can solve a problem or two for you. That all of a sudden the gift God gave you begins to wean you off of his hand. All of a sudden the six hand breaths that make up the cubit of your arm, the mother of your arm begin to slowly but surely wean you off of believing you are in need of the hand of the Lord. And this right here is exactly where I wanna be because listen to me, I brought you to Ezekiel 43. And in Ezekiel 43, God comes to a man by the name of Ezekiel and he says, I need you to rebuild the altar, my man. I need you to rebuild the temple. And then all of a sudden, God flips the script. Up until this moment, Everyone's been allowed to build things by a normal cubit. And then God changes the rules. In Ezekiel 43, God says, you can't build by a normal cubit. Let's throw it back up. Ezekiel 43, verse 13. He says this, these are the measurements of the altar in cubits. The cubit is one cubit and one more hand breadth. God is saying this, 
Everything else you can build with your six hand breaths. Everything else, you can build a tower to the sky, you can build an ark, you can build a wall, you can build weapons of war, you can build a house, you can build a family, you can build anything you want with six hand breaths. But if you're gonna build my house, if you're gonna build a place I will dwell, if you're gonna build something worth anointing, it's gonna take an extra hand. It's gonna take a seventh hand on what I am gonna do in your life. Is there anybody who believes that they still need the hand of God in order to accomplish the will of God in the Rio Grande Valley? I still believe we need the hand of God. Listen to me. Let me break this down. Six, theologically, is the number that represents man. Six is the number of man. And listen to me. It's not a favorable number for man. It does not speak well of man. This is why the number for the Antichrist is 666. He's carnal to the bone. Flesh to the bone. No spirit about him. Six is the number of man, but I told you this is the seventh hand. You know what seven theologically means? It is a number that represents two things. Completion and perfection. Completion and perfection. Listen to me. It is not a quantum leap from six to seven, but it makes all the difference in the world. Some of you are like, man, I'm pretty gifted. I've got a little pop-up shop going for me. My YouTube channel's popping off. I've got the drip. I've got the girl. Listen, you ain't nothing until that seventh hand gets on your business venture. You ain't nothing until that seventh hand gets on that relationship. Your ministry's nothing until the seventh hand. Water's getting slain in the spirit. Listen to me, I came all the way here tonight to tell you, you need the hand of God. Like if you're gonna live this thing out, if you're gonna leave this conference and it not just be a sweet little memory that you question the legitimacy of for the rest of your life, you need the hand of God. If you're actually going to walk this thing out, can I tell you right now, I don't stand on this stage as a gifted orator or a gifted speaker or a gifted communicator. You know why I'm able to stand on this stage? God, in his sovereignty, said, you know what? Amen. I'll put my hand on it. I'm about as gifted as that right there. I would buckle under the weight. Wow. I'd never be able to stand on a platform God's called me to stand on. Lord, thank you for that. But it's his hand. I get people asking me all the time, and I, I don't want to talk about this because it's not my heart, but I do want to make it clear. I get people asking me all the time, Keenan, how do you do the social media thing? Like, you need to teach me. And I'm like, bro, I don't know what to teach you. It's the anointing. Like I don't, there's nothing I'm doing that you can copy and paste except like fast and, and pray and, and obey and, and, and like lay stuff down when God asks you to lay stuff down and post things that you think, oh, this would never work, but it's true and it's Bible and all of a sudden God just, he puts his hand on it. I'm here to tell you, God wants to give you a life that the only way people can copy and paste it is if they get under the same hand you got under. And it's the hand of God. I hear preachers all the time say stuff like, you know what, I don't want to overly spiritualize this. I don't want to overly spiritualize it. I came to the Rio Grande Valley on a mission to spiritualize this thing. Listen to me. Your life is infinitely more spiritual than you are aware of. Last I checked, the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty in our God. For the pulling down of strongholds, for the tearing down of every pretension that tries to set itself up against the knowledge of our God. We don't battle against flesh and blood but against powers, against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What I'm trying to get you to see is all of your problems in the natural, I guarantee you they are tied to something in the spirit. And it's why nothing else has worked. It's why the six hand breaths of you still doesn't work. It's because God has placed it just out of reach. 
It takes his seventh unseen hand. If I could have somebody play on the keys, it will pressure me to make sure I close in a decent time. But listen to me. The Bible says this, that there was a famine in the land. There was a famine in the land. It had not rained for three and a half years. So an Old Testament prophet by the name of Elijah goes onto a mountain called Mount Carmel and he takes his servant with him. And your Bible says this, that he puts his head between his knees and he begins to pray. Three and a half years of no rain. And Elijah says, we're gonna go up on a mountain and we're gonna pray. And then he tells his servant this, I'm gonna pray and you need to go out to the cliff and I want you to look over the sea and tell me if you can see a storm brewing. Hadn't rained in three and a half years. And Elijah says, I'm gonna pray. You go and look and see if you can see a storm. So Elijah's praying and his servant comes back and Elijah says, what did you see? And the servant says, I, 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 I saw nothing. Elijah says, go back. And all of a sudden the servant goes back and he looks over the cliff, he looks out over the sea and he sees nothing. So he comes back and he tells Elijah, hey Elijah, I, I saw nothing. And Elijah says, go back. Tell me what you see. Goes a third time, sees nothing. Elijah says, go again. He goes and looks again, sees nothing. He comes back, Elijah says, go again. He goes a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time. He tells Elijah, I've seen nothing. And Elijah says, go again. Go a seventh time. And this is what 1 Kings 18.44 says. 1 Kings 18.44 says this. Finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw a cloud about the size. of a man's hand on the seventh trip he sees a cloud the size of a man's hand the bible's not boring we're boring the bible's not boring dead old religion is boring the hand of god is exhilarating the seventh hand of god is like nitrous to the christian spirit i'm here to tell you tonight a cloud after three and a half years that is only the size of a man's hand is not a promising cloud it doesn't exactly scream gully washer torrential downpour floods are coming but here's the crazy thing elijah sees a cloud the size of a man's hand and he goes berserk he literally says run for your life and your bible says this that elijah after seeing a cloud the size of a man's hand the seventh time he outran the horses of Ahab on foot. That's what your Bible says. That Elijah on foot outran the horses and chariots of Ahab. That literally an evil, maniacal, backslidden king by the name of Ahab could not outrun with horses this man who got a glimpse of the seventh hand of God, who got a glimpse of the anointing of God, who got a glimpse of the touch of God. Woo! You know what this tells me? You know what theologians believe about this moment? Theologians believe that the horses of Ahab represent prophetically what Revelation calls the horses of the apocalypse. Go read Revelation. It talks about the horses of the apocalypse. You know what this is? It's a foreshadowing of the last days. It's a foreshadowing of the end times. And I came here to put you on notice. I wanted to prophesy to you tonight that the man who has had a glimpse of the seventh hand won't be subject to the end times, but he will outrun the end times. When the hand of God gets on you, the end times aren't happening to you. You begin to happen to the end times. We need a generation who doesn't just know how to sing and doesn't just know how to preach and doesn't just wear the cool Christian merch, but they've encountered the seventh hand of God. That that seventh unseen hand gets on you. And it convinces you that if God be for you, who can be against you? I feel this in my spirit. I didn't even have this plan. 
But you know what happens right after that moment? Elijah sees. He's just, God responded in fire, burnt up an altar that Elijah had dumped water on. Water and fire do not mix. God shows up. Then Elijah kills the 400 prophets of Baal. Then he prays. Rain shows up after three and a half year drought. Then he outruns the horses of Ahab. And you know what? After all that, after seeing the hand of God move wildly, a little queen by the name of Jezebel. Her spirit is at work in this day and age today. Spirit of Jezebel. She doesn't like that Elijah's got the hand of God on his life. And she says this, cursed be me if by this time tomorrow I don't kill Elijah. She puts out this decree, I'm going to kill him after seeing the hand of God on his life. And you know what happens? It's like Elijah completely forgets the hand of God is on his life. He goes into a deep depression. She's going to kill me. Dude, you just saw the hand of God. You outran horses on foot. And now you're afraid that Jezebel's going to kill you? But here's the cool thing. Though Elijah forgot the hand of God, it never caused God to remove his hand. And here's how I know. Here's how I know. Hold the clap because it's about to be clappable. Here's how I know. Elijah is in a very elite group in the Bible. It's, it, it's so elite. It's not so elite, but it's, it's elite in the fact that Jesus isn't even included in this group. You know what Elijah, a group Elijah's in? Two people who never died. She prophesies, curse be me if by this time tomorrow I don't kill you. To the one man who literally never died, God took him. I'm here to tell you that the word of the enemy won't just come to pass how you think it will. It's not coming to pass at all because the hand of God is on your life. You've got to get convinced that the anointing makes the difference. That at the end of the day, come hell or high water, it's not on my gifting. It's not on my ability. It's not on how good I am. It's on the anointing. Isaiah says this, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. I love a good LED screen, but I've never seen the LED screen break a yoke off somebody. And I'm thankful for curated environments. I'm thankful for aesthetic venues. But when we bank on the aesthetics of our event, when we bank on how good each song flows into the next song, rather than knowing God, we're gonna do everything we can, like our six hand breaths have to be in place for the seventh to be identifiable as the seventh. Like the six hands have to be there for the seventh to show up. But what we are banking on, what our preparation is all for, is that when that seventh hand shows up, he can do whatever he wants. All bets are off. And listen to me. I promise I'm almost done. A week ago today, I was thinking about this message. And I thought it was over. And God took me to a passage of scripture and blew me away and I believe this is, this is where I literally land the plane and we're gonna pray for some people and I believe God's gonna put his hand on some people. But if you'll just sit down, let me unpack this for you just for a moment. This was wild when God gave it to me. I said, God, I feel you stirring. I feel like this sermon's done, but I feel like you're also telling me it's not. And God says, the last nugget of the sermon is found in Luke chapter seven. Before I throw it up, before I throw it up, let me tell you what Luke chapter seven says. If you were to jump into the literal Bible, find yourself within the pages of scripture and you were to travel over to Luke 7, what you would walk into is a village called Nain. You would walk into a village by the name of Nain and, and particularly in chapter 7, you would see a woman walking, weeping hysterically. And behind this woman, there is a funeral procession. There's a casket following this woman. This woman, in the casket lies her son's dead corpse. Her son has died, and they're carrying his lifeless body to an early grave. But here's the interesting thing about this woman. She's not just any old woman. The Bible calls her the widow of Nain, which means she's lost her son, but at one point she also lost her husband. Here's what I'm trying to point out to you. There is evidently 
an attack on the men of the family. The same is true today. There's an attack on biblical masculinity. There is an attack on men being able to actually stand up and be men. God is after, or God, excuse me, God is after protecting the head of the home, and that's why Satan is interested in annihilating the head of the home. Notice this, what got the dad eventually got the boy. We don't even know what it is. But what got the dad eventually got the boy. Listen to me, I'm speaking to some current fathers, but I'm also prophesying to some one day fathers. What you tolerate, your children will walk in. One, gener one generation's complacency becomes the next generation's captivity. If fathers don't stand up in this day and in this age, your children will suffer the consequences. And some of you tonight, the devil's got his hands around your jugular because of something your dad passed down to you. I'm talking to some men tonight. Can't say yes to the hand of God because all your hands can find is P-O-R-N. Can't break a spirit of bondage. Can't step into all that God's called you to be because the clutches of addiction have wrapped themselves tightly. And who introduced you to it? Either a father or a father-like figure. As a coach, older male in your life, and I feel tonight the Lord saying, I'm coming to restore what your father couldn't protect you from. I am coming to restore what your father couldn't protect you from. Here's the interesting thing though, there's not just a woman in a casket. The Bible calls attention to this. There are pallbearers, pallbearers. The Lord said, Kenan, look at the pallbearers. The literal word pallbearer, bearer is mentioned in the text. This means that there are men carrying the casket behind this woman. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of being a pallbearer at a funeral, but the privilege of being a pallbearer is strictly reserved for people who were very near and dear to the deceased. And what I'm trying to get you to see is those nearest and dearest to this young man, no matter how much they loved him, they couldn't keep the hand of the enemy off of him. I, they loved him to death. They loved him deeply. But it didn't matter how much they loved him. Their six hand breaths are powerless. And all of a sudden I began to go to this text and the Lord said, I want to speak to you through the pallbearers. And I began to wonder, I wonder how many pallbearers there were. And the Bible's not very clear. It just says there are pallbearers. So then I had to go to the next best source, Google. Studying the Bible will make you Google strange things. I Googled how many pallbearers on average are there in a funeral procession? Google told me six, three on each side. So it is safe to assume there are six pallbearers in this funeral procession. What I'm trying to get you to see is this picture. There are six hands carrying a casket to an early grave. And here's the good news. Jesus walks into a village called Nain. He sees a funeral procession. And notice this, it wasn't the resume of the young man in the casket who convinced him to stop. It was the tears of a mother. Jesus had compassion. There was nothing impressive about the funeral. His accolades, the eulogy mentioned about him did not coerce Jesus. And Jesus is like, you know what? This is worth intervening on. This guy, you know, could really do something for my kingdom. It was the compassion of the Lord. Simply his compassion. And your Bible, listen to me, this is where it all comes down. Your Bible makes it very clear in certain moments when Jesus wants to do something radical, he'll clear the room. Go read about Jesus raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. He says, everybody out, clear the room. I need some space. This is one of the moments Jesus needs no space. Jesus doesn't go, hey, Mr. Paul Bearers, will you set the casket down and back away? I wanna do something. Jesus in essence says, leave your six hands on there. 
Just let me put my seventh hand on with it. Jesus places a seventh hand on that casket. And you know what happens? Upon Jesus placing his hand on the coffin. Well, let's read it. It says this. Luke chapter 7, verses 13 through 15. Now when the Lord saw her, his heart was overwhelmed with compassion. Do not cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it. And the bearers, the Paul bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. Listen to this. And Jesus gave him back. And Jesus gave him back to his mother you know what's gonna bring a generation back it's the seventh hand of god it's when the hand of the lord gets on a generation we need the seventh hand of god and there are some of you tonight you're not ezekiel trying to build something for god you're not even Elijah trying to call down rain and bring a miracle. You're a young man or a young woman who feels like they are in a coffin. You feel like your story's over. And some of you, I feel this by the Spirit of the Lord. Some of you tonight, this was your last ditch effort. I know God has moved wildly, but for some reason each night, Though you were impressed by the production and the performance and you saw people getting touched, it never got through to you. And I feel the tender touch of God coming upon you tonight, saying it's not about you revving yourself up. It's not about working yourself into a Christian frenzy. It's about allowing my hand. It's allowing the anointing. Can I tell you today, this is old, but we still need the oil in the church. We need the oil. I get to travel a lot of places and it is very rare that a church has oil on hand when I ask. How sad is that? I think it's indicative of the predicament we are in. An oilless church. We've got cool cameras, we've got cool lights, and I'm all about the cameras, and I'm all about the lights. I want to leverage technology in the direction of the gospel. I want to use everything. I want the six hand breaths to be there, but what I am banking on is that the seventh hand is going to show up. Listen to me, Luke 7, you know what it's a picture of? The gospel, there's a dead young man, can't do anything for himself, and God comes to him. Jesus strategically goes to a village where a young man is being placed into an early grave, and the compassion of the Lord, not the young man's performance. It's not like Jesus looked at his high school statistics, you know, sport highlight reel, and was like, this guy's worth resurrecting. It's the grace of God. It's but the mercy of the Lord that had God not intervened, had God not in his own sovereignty decided to show himself strong on my behalf, I would still be dead in my sins. Luke 7 is me. It's you. And tonight, whether you, maybe you don't know Jesus, or maybe you know him, but it's been a long time. And, and you're ready to come home. You're, you're ready to come back. Whether you're on the floor, you're up in the balcony somewhere. I feel the hand of God saying, I'll touch you tonight. I'll put my oil on you tonight. I'll mark you tonight. Listen to me. The Lord told me this. I want to anoint a generation tonight. That's what the Lord said. I want to anoint a generation.
I carry a little vial of oil everywhere I go. I haven't always done it, but a while back, the Lord gripped my heart. He said, Kenan, in the last days, you got to stay strapped. That's how he said it. Kenan, you never know. I don't, you don't just need to carry oil into church services. You need to carry oil into Walmart. You need to carry your oil into education facilities. You need to carry oil into coffee shop meetings. You need to carry oil as you're just going across town in your car. How many lives have been cut too short by a simple drive across town? And I'm not acting like our faith is in some oil. My faith is not in this oil. My faith is in the one who put his oil on me. And the Lord said tonight, come on. The Lord said, I want to anoint a generation. I want to end this conference by anointing a generation. Listen to me with your head bowed and your eyes closed just for a moment of privacy and concentration. If you know that I am speaking to you tonight, if you know that your six hands are not enough, that the mother of your arm, that the gift, the talent, the ability that God's given you, some of you are academically off the charts, but it's still not enough. Incredibly good looking, but it's still not enough. Come from a very affluent family, and it's still not enough. And some of you, you're on the polar opposite end of the spectrum. You come from the sticks, and it's not enough. You make horrible grades, and it's not enough. You get cut from every team, and it's not enough. Here's the good news. The oil is the great equalizer. The oil makes the difference. The hand of God makes the difference. And with your head bowed and eyes closed, if you would say, Keen, and you're preaching to me tonight, I need the seventh hand of God. I need the tender touch of God. I need the anointing. If you would say, Keenan, I want God to literally anoint me afresh and anew tonight. Some of you, maybe you've been anointed in the past, but you say, Keenan, I need it afresh and anew. I want you to raise your hand right now so I know who I'm praying for. If you know you need a fresh oil, you need fresh oil, you need a fresh inundation, you need a fresh touch. Good God, that's so many hands. Praise the Lord. Listen, we have leaders on hand who have oil. Can we get the leaders? Listen to me, it's too many hands to invite you to the front. I was gonna invite you up, but it's way too many of you. It would be chaos in here. Can we have leaders who have oil I want us to go through, and everyone who wants to be anointed, I want every hand to be anointed. I want every hand in the air to make sure they get touched with some oil tonight. Listen to me. It's not about the literal oil. It is a symbol. I can't tell you why the literal oil makes a difference, but there's something about it God honors. There's something about it that says God, God sees, hey, they're prioritizing my presence. They want a tender touch. They're posturing themselves right in line with my hand. And something about it is honored by God. I can't explain it better than that. But something about it is honored by the Lord. I'm thankful I grew up in a church that knew about the oil. I'm thankful I serve a God who even when the church has forgotten the oil, he still remembers right where it's at. And tonight, we're going to have our leaders literally begin to anoint you. Listen to me. If you are on the front couple rows and you are on these exit rows, I want you to come to the front of the stage. If you are on the front couple rows or the exit rows, exit aisle, the exit chairs of your row, I want you to come forward. We will anoint you up here, and it will make the people in the middle a little easier to access. We are going to literally anoint you, and we're going to worship. We're going to worship. Some of you didn't raise your hand, that's totally fine. Evidently that means you're pretty confident in the oil you've already got. So that means that you ought to worship louder than everybody else in the room. If your hand didn't go up, you're secure in your oil, that's great, I'm thankful for you tonight. But you ought to worship louder than everybody else. Come on, come on, if you're on this exit aisle, if you're on the exit aisle, I need some leaders to get up in the balcony. I need some leaders in the balcony to begin to anoint some people up in the balcony. Come on, if I can get some leaders on the stage with me who've got oil, you got some oil? 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Spirit of the Lord is all over you. Jesus, right now, in the name of Jesus, I call him anointed. I call him fresh. Lord, put your seventh hand on him now. Put your seventh hand on him now. Lord, do for him what he cannot do for himself. Make space for him he doesn't know how to make. Father, I thank you that you put his name on the minds of leaders. You put his name on the mind of influential people so he can make a difference for your kingdom. Fill him fresh, God. Put your seventh hand on him tonight. Come on, let's bust it out. Let's bust it out. Come on, now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 